to Susan Barger. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you here. I'm, I'm sorry again about last week, um, and, but the recording was fine, so I hope you all have heard it. And um, so today's May Day, and May Day is also used as a day to encourage people to remember to do emergency preparedness in their institutions. So I'm going to do that, too. So the last two webinars in this series are May 8th next week and June 5th. So we'll see you for those. And again, if you need to reset your password, you can contact info at culturalheritage.org. If you have any other questions, contact me at c2cc at culturalheritage.org. And if you have a question about course content or something, put it on the discussion. That'll uh, That'll get it to people faster than getting it, sending something to me. And um, if you want to keep informed about what's going on with Connecting to Collections Care, you can join the new discussion list. And this is the link to for instructions on how to do that. And we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. And uh, actually, concurrently now with us, there are some uh, Facebook Live things going on for May Day. And there'll be one in a couple of hours. So if you miss the first two, you can see the last one. Um, and next week, we have a free webinar on uh, caring for herbaria. And um, that should be really interesting. So if you'd like, you can join us there. And now I'm going to turn this over to Rachel Arenstein. Uh, it turns out Simon won't be here today, but you're in good hands with her. So remember, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box, and I will make sure they get answered at the end. OK. Uh, you're uh, all set, Rebecca. Hi. Thank you, Susan. Um, I know that uh, Simon is sorry that uh, he couldn't be with us today, but um, we will uh, forge ahead. He's uh, And we have some slides from him that I'll uh, introduce today's program. And uh, so let's jump into webinar four. Um, again, um, I'm Rachel Arenstein, and um, I'm going to be presenting today along with Rebecca Newberry. And um, you'll also be hearing from me next week um, for the fifth webinar in the series. So um, the objective for this course uh, as you see here, is um, that by the end of the all six webinars, you'll be able to develop a basic reorg plan to improve collections access and care in one storage room. And today is the fourth in our series of six. And um, what we're hoping to focus on today um, is giving you examples and some resources uh, where you can find other information that will help you develop custom storage solutions for different types of objects. We're also going to cover basic principles for selecting materials that are safe for long-term storage of collections, even if they are not conservation grade material or archival quality. So we'll focus on those, but um, we'll also talk about you know, some, some other ways that you can um, use these materials or um, find uh, replacements. So just a reminder that the reorg method, which is at the core of this course, is available online on ICRAM's website. It's available in four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, uh, and others are in the works. Um, the reorg method was developed by ICRAM with the support of UNESCO and was adapted for distance learning thanks to a collaboration with the Canadian Conservation Institute. Um, I highly recommend um, taking a look at the, this additional material um, you know, beyond uh, the, the webinar courses. Um, an additional announcement for today is that um, the, first, the first one is that the registrations are now open for the Reorg India International Workshop. The deadline for applying is May 15th. Um, this course is for you if you have already implemented a storage reorganization and now want to become a Reorg coach. 
That means that you'd be able to lead um, a team within a museum that's organizing um, their storage to, um, to help other institutions. So um, if this is work that you're interested in doing outside of your institution or if you're um, a conservator in private practice, um, this is, and that you've already done a, a project like this, this is um, a, the, a way to take your ability to organize and, and instruct to the next level. So they sort of, um, it's being promoted as like a reorg leadership course or train the trainers. Um, so details are for this are available on the ICROM website on the um, link that you see here. Um, another reminder for those of you listening today, um, if you are attending the uh, American Institute for Conservation's 47th annual meeting, which will be in Uncasville, Connecticut at the Mohegan Sun uh, Resort, um, which will be in a couple of weeks, we are organizing um, a, a on-site one-day re reorg project, which will be held at the New London Maritime Museum on May 13th. Uh, it's a full day event from 9 to 5. If you're interested in joining um, myself and Simon uh, and Lisa, who will be also one of the instructors, um, and you can make it to New London, all you have to do is send a CV and an email indicating um, interest to Ruth Seiler in the AIC office, and her email is listed here at the bottom of the slide. So this, we, we have been, um, sort of going through the process, what all of you who have been doing the assignments are doing at home. We have been um, doing with uh, um, Susan, who is the director of the Maritime Museum, and you're going to hear more about how we've, uh, the sort of mini projects and plans that we have come up with for her project um, in next week's program. So now I just want to do a quick recap of last week's session by um, Ho uh, Jose Luis and Marjo. We said that there are various lenses through which you can examine your storage to develop your reorg project. The first webinar is focused on optimizing space, focusing on dimension and weight. Uh, but then last week, uh, the presenters introduced two other lenses, relative value and collection vulnerability. Um, Zhe showed us um, one way to start building your own relative value categories, from treasures to things of average value and things that are not relevant or non-collection. And then Marjo introduced an example of how you can use your relative value categories and map them, starting with your treasures. So why would we want to do this? Well. It can be useful for emergency response purposes to know where your high value items are. It can also lead to discussions with curators and collection managers about how security could be improved for these items or um, on how we might improve the visitor experience if we intend to organize open storage tours for the public um, by rearranging some of the, the treasures. And then Zay reminded us again of the 10 agents of deterioration. You know, these are things that um, act upon our collections. So past pollutants, light and UV, incorrect temperature, incorrect relative humidity, disassociation, physical forces, criminals, fire, and water. Um, and the Canadian Conservation Institute uh, has a really great explanation of, of these issues and how they impact collections on their website, available both in English and in French. So after Zeb reminded us of those 10 agents, um, we were also introduced to the concept of vulnerability and to use this diagram to illustrate how in our reorg project we should be focusing on improving storage conditions for objects that are vulnerable to a certain type of damage and that are exposed to the agent that causes that damage. Although textiles dyed with certain colorants may be extremely vulnerable to light and UV, if they're currently stored in boxes, they're not exposed to light or UV, so they're not affected. So we shouldn't worry about that too much. So remember, in your reorg project, 
you don't want to aggravate any risks by increasing the exposure to vulnerable items. If you can, you want to reduce that exposure. And then in practice, Marja showed us how you can use a floor plan with your building fixtures to map the paths taken by the agents of deterioration in your space. This is the exposure part. So now if you have collections that are particularly vulnerable to those agents in those locations, you can start to think about how you might avoid or block that exposure. So mapping your windows, um, doors, uh, vents, um, pipes uh, will all affect you know, how you might choose to reorganize your space. And so now I'd like to um, pass, uh, pass the baton over to Rebecca Newbery and um, ask her to introduce herself and um, take, us, take us on. Thanks, Rachel. So hi, I'm Rebecca Newbery. Um, I go by Rebecca, but sometimes people call me Rachel, uh, which happens to Rachel as well, who goes to call Rebecca. It's a common biblical name mix-up, so we answer to either. Um, I'm an objects conservator. I specialize in preventive conservation, and I work with the Natural Science and Cultural Collection. Um, at the Science Museum of Minnesota, we've been employing creative storage solutions for many years, um, drawing inspiration from sources like Stash, which we'll talk to you about later. Um, and I worked on our collections move from uh, 1998 to 1999, um, which you would think is the ultimate reorg project, but you know you can't always think of everything during a move, and we've had to retrofit and reimagine space use and storage solutions several times since then. Um, and I like to think of object storage as a constantly evolving and improving project. Um, so you're never finished, but that means you get to keep up dreaming better solutions for storage. So the Institute uh, for Museum and Library Services, IMLS, has just released the results of the 2014 Heritage Health Information Survey. And um, they have shown that 32% of responding institutions to the survey reported uh, damage or loss to their collections in the preceding two years before the survey. And of this number, the damage from improper storage was the second highest cause of damage at 45%. Um, this brings us to our first poll. Mike can bring that up. Have you ever had something um, damaged due to improper storage? The second highest, um, or the third highest cause of damage in uh, the survey was due to improper handling. And so crowded or improper storage um, can also raise the risk of damage from handling. Um, you know, in reorg, we look to uh, a standard of only having to move fewer than three objects to get to something. And that's the kind of thing that increases risk to handling if you have to move a lot of stuff. So yeah, it looks like it's pretty solid. Everyone is almost, almost everyone has had something damaged in storage. Rebecca, um, I'm, I'm noticing, uh, I'm not sure if everybody else is seeing the same thing, that there is something cut off on the previous slide. Yeah, that slide, slide is so, cut off. Yeah, can you just confirm that it is 32%? 32% of collecting is okay. not 2%. So, I'd say yeah. we'd love to get it to 2%. Yeah, <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's the goal for the next uh, Heritage Health Information Survey. Indeed. All right. Um, hopefully, it hasn't cut off other slides. Um, OK, so now, by now in this course, um, we've done a lot of thinking about the protective layers around um, our collections. You know, we start with our region, our site, our building. Um, and then with the REARG project, we're looking at our storage rooms, our storage equipment. We've also considered the collections value and assessing risk to collections. So now, in this uh, webinar, we're going to focus on the smallest box that our objects come in. That's the storage housing. We're going to bring up our second poll question, uh, which would be, what types of objects are your collections predominantly? Help us um, give you some, or guide our discussion on things that uh, will help answer your questions. Um, 
So when developing your creative storage solutions, you really have to start from the object itself. Um, and you've already looked at all of your different objects. Um, you want to see what's the reorg object category um, that your objects fall into. But you also want to consider what the objects are made from, what material they're made from. Because different types of materials, say ceramics versus textiles versus metals, they have different needs in storage. And where you're storing something matters, too. You, know, you need to understand the doors, the windows, the lights leaky ceilings. Um, you need to make sure that the, that the objects are going to fit back into the space that you have with the mounts that you give them. And you also want to make sure that you, uh, your solutions are affordable, that they fit within your budget. You don't want to choose a storage method that involves supplies you can't afford or you can't source. Um, some supplies could be available from commercial retailers at a lower cost than you can get them at archival vendors. But you want to be careful about the quality of your materials. You could end up with some inferior foam or inferior plastics that are going to break down and react with your objects. Um, something could be branded as a polyethylene foam, but it could have a lot of additives in it that might make it break down over time. It looks like 3D objects are the majority of people's storage. So that's where I'm at, too. Perfect. <laughs> um, so the last thing you want to think about is can you um, standardize or simplify your storage solutions? So looking at um, dividing your tasks, um, if, you can, if you can make a streamlined or like a, a conveyor belt almost um, method of storing so that volunteers and staff could do parts of the storage mounts. Um, but really the best storage solutions are ones that work for you. So they're ones that are safe for the objects, that are practical for you. Um, and also remember that your storage improvements are an ongoing project. So considering the values and the risks of your collection, you want to use your resources wisely and improve storage for as much of your collection as possible, rather than focusing the majority of them on like perfect solutions for a limited number of objects. So let's consider one object. Um, look at, think about your unique situation. Let's look at one object and consider a few solutions for storage for that. So we have here a glazed ceramic bowl. It's a number six in the reorg object category list. That's a light, self-supporting object that can be carried by one person with two hands, weighing between half a kilo and 10 kilograms, or 1 to 20 pounds. Um, what else do we know about it? It's ceramic. Um, so we know it's an inorganic thing. Um, we also know that it's got a round bottom. Um, so it doesn't sit very nicely. It's going to need something to keep it from wobbling around in storage. The rim looks like it's in good shape. And it's a fairly common type of object. I mean, I know I have more objects like this. I bet you have more, are more objects like this. So standardizing a storage technique would be a great idea for something like this bowl, something that you could streamline in storage. So here's some solutions. Um, we could think about uh, just flipping it over and um, putting it on a stationary shelf, sticking it on its rim. It's going to be fine. It'll, it won't move. It's space efficient. But you do handle face handling um, risks. So if you have to pick it up frequently, that means that you're flipping it over all the time. It's harder to handle something that's upside down. Um, you also can't see the design on the interior. So if you want to see that interior of the bowl easier and you want to be able to pick it up more easily, you can just make a quick twist of acid-free tissue paper into a ring. It's economical, but making that ring takes a little more skill than you may think at first. And it can easily be crushed or deformed. And um, it also doesn't protect the rim of the object. You could easily bump into things adjacent to it. And if you have higher uncontrolled relative humidity in your storage, that paper can attract moisture and mold could grow on it. So what are some other options? Um, this uh, one on the left is just a simple back polyethylene backer rod ring. So backer rod's inexpensive. You can get it from um, construction supply or hardware stores. It's inexpensive, um, but it takes a little training to use well. You can either use hot glue to attach the ends, or you can tie the ring together. Um, the rings provide both padding and support, which is nice. Um, if you've got a lot of stuff that's the same size, you might be able to mass produce rings at the same size. Um, and ring mounts are ideal on either fixed um, stationary shelves or on compacted shelves that move. But you've got to be careful not to bump the rim into adjacent objects still. Um, if you mount that ring to a board, 
then you can protect the rim because the board is slightly larger than the object. So if you stick it in storage, the board's going to bump into the board of the object next to it rather than the rims against each other. Um, and the cavity mount uh, on the right is going to provide the most support. But it's also going to take the most materials, the most skill, the most preparation time, and the most space in storage. Um, but it could be the best option for that bowl if it's frequently handled or if you're transporting it quite a bit because it is more supportive. And there's other options for storing round bottom ceramics. You can put foam wedges onto a board. Um, you can make foam cradles. There's a bunch of different things. So now we're going to bring uh, Rachel back in um, to talk about some online resources we hope you'll find helpful. Rachel, are you there? Sorry, thank you. I muted myself. Oh. <laughs> I was talking away. So apologies. Um, so I just wanted to mention a little bit about um, my background. Uh, I'm an object conservator by training uh, in private practice in the New York area. Uh, and um, a lot of my clients are small to mid-sized museums. And so I see a lot of spaces that um, you know, could benefit from the, the reorg method. I'm also uh, AIC's e-editor. Um, and one of the things that, um, that I uh, oversee as one of our professional platforms is a website called Stash. As um, my colleague Lisa Goldberg, who you'll hear from in the sixth webinar, um, and I were developing Stash, we, um, the reorg website was launched. And we were despondent for a few minutes while we thought we've just worked for a couple of years to develop a website that was sort of gazumped um, in a matter of months by, by reorg. And when we looked at the reorg site, we were really thrilled because we realized that the two sites are, are complementary uh, and that reorg really deals with the big picture of storage. And um, Stash, which I'll come to in a second, uh, focuses down at the object level. But in conjunction with um, the reorg site, Reorg also has this um, Tumblr page. Um, and so Tumblr is sort of like a, a, a mini like blog site. And what you're seeing here on the screen are actually sort of two screenshots. Um, so, uh, but what's really nice about uh, the Tumblr page is that you can sort of scroll down uh, and see lots of uh, different things that people have done and posted to the site. So it's highly visual. Uh, and so you can sort of look at some of these before and after. You can sort of see you know, details of projects or um, things sort of in, in the works and really get a sense of um, how much progress can, can be made with um, reasonably accessible you know, materials. And then what you see on the right of the screen where the, um, with the red um, print and the big red arrow is um, some of those uh, solutions have been also posted to the Stash B website. And so um, if you click on the link, it will take you to um, Stash. Um, so this site has taken, um, some of you may be familiar with uh, a book that was published in um, the early 90s by the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. Uh, that, and that bo book focused on sort of um, practical uh, tools and solutions for storage. After being reprinted a couple of times, um, it needed a bit of a, a refresher. And so um, the decision was to turn it into an online resource, which is, uh, which is Stash. Uh, so the thing that um, we hope people will um, find useful on um, Stash is uh, you can search for, for things um, using the search tool. Um, but if you click on the solutions uh, tab, it's going to take you to the, the next page where you have sort of a whole uh, left-hand menu. Um, so in this case, we're not focusing on um, the kind of material you have, but we're focusing on um, the, the type of solution. Uh, so we move just like the um, diagram that Rebecca showed you a, a short while ago with you know, sort of the, the room to cabinet 
uh, to um, shelving down to the object level, so you know, to, to containers. There's a lot of different objects here, um, solutions here, and we hope that by sort of browsing through them, uh, you'll be able to sort of see like, oh, well, there's lots of different styles of, of boxes. You know, here's one that matches sort of um, my either skill level or you know materials. Um, and so within any um, oh, within any entry, um, you can sort of see what the purpose of what. Or, or tips on sort of um, if you want to create a lid, you know, how much room do you need to leave, you know, things like that that are, are designed to help you. Um, there's, you know, creative ideas that, um, that were all developed by um, collection managers, registrars, conservators, mount makers. Um, and so if you don't see something um, on the website uh, that you're interested in, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and if you see something on the website that um, is is sort of similar to something that you've done, but you think you've made an improvement, we'd love to have that as well. the The goal is to sort of show um, all sorts of different permutations and um, variations uh, on on these these ideas. There's also a comments feature uh, on, on each of the solution pages. Um, we also occasionally. Um, well, at least for the last five years at the um, AIC annual meeting, and this will be the second year at the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections annual meeting, where we've had um, what we call the stash flash sessions, where people give like five-minute storage tips. Um, we're always looking to um, spread the word on that. And so if you're a member of another society and think that this would be um, a good way to sort of spread the word about this resource and um, storage, um, we'd love to hear from you uh, and help you organize a, a stash flash session for, um, for your meeting. Um, in addition, um, uh, when we get into the presentation um, later, we'll be talking more specifically about material supplies and um, all of the uh, materials that are mentioned in the stash articles are listed in um, this, uh, the resources section of the, the site in, in this list. Um, and we didn't, in our handout for today's presentation, give a list of suppliers. Many of them would probably be familiar to you. Uh, and they do change. And as uh, Rebecca said, sometimes you can find um, other you know, similar materials at, at other vendors. Um, uh, they may or may not be the same exact material and the same exact quality. Um, but but we encourage you to, to check out some of these resources where, where vendors are um, list, listed so that you know, that is, uh, is kept up to date. So Rebecca, back to you. All right. So um, Reorg classifies objects into 12 categories. And these are different than how Stash classifies objects. Um, so for your convenience, we put together a spreadsheet that correlates the reorg object categories with the stash solution categories. Um, so it's in the resources for this session. Um, and there's one tab that uh, organizes everything by the stash solution category. And then there's the second tab organizes everything by the reorg object category. And then each solution. Um, is linked, so you should be able to just click on the um, name of the solution, and it'll link you to the article. So um, just to let you know that many of the images in here either came from, uh, from the reorg Tumblr or also from my work at the Science Museum. And we use have used Stash and the predecessor, the Spinach Storage Handbook, as inspiration for many years to, um, to uh, build our storage mounts. And so, the nice thing about storage mounts is that if you can prototype a mount and you can train people to do it, then you can really share the workload with um, volunteers and other staff and present you know, better storage for your collections. First object category, number one, are extra heavy or voluminous objects difficult to manipulate. These are often outliers in your collection. Um, 
So they generally require really customized housings. Um, so placing these objects on pallets or carts is a great option. Wheels make it easy to move the object around. Always buy the best wheels you could afford. Um, the cart on the left for the sculpture, it doesn't take up a ton of extra floor space. And it makes the object easy to move so they can access the storage um, uh, behind it, so they can move it around as they need to. Um, if you were going to keep this in a fixed location and you were going to store it for a long time, you might consider blocking the wheels up off the floor so that, that the cart isn't resting on the wheels, because they can deform over you know several years of storage of not being moved. Um, pallets, like the ones shown in the picture of the right, these are uh, another great option. These are just commercially available wood pallets. And we decked them with plywood. And then we screwed down the shoulder mounts of all these taxidermy mounts through the backing boards of the taxidermy. And then uh, we tented them with polyethylene sheeting over just wood framing. Um, they're really handy. You can see through them. You can move them with a pallet jack, or you can move them with a forklift. So with a pallet, something like that that doesn't have wheels on it, you have to make sure you have the equipment to move it, and you have to make sure you have room to move that equipment. So like in this warehouse space, we have to have enough room to bring a forklift in to pull this stuff down. Our number two category, um, extra long objects not self-supporting. They're also ideal candidates for carts. Um, they can also work well on cantilevered shelving if that's within your budget. So cantilevered shelving is only supported from the underside. So it gives you long, interrupted surfaces. This is a, a cart made from lumber and from polyethylene foam um, to support a canoe. And then the extra pieces of uh, lumber on the edges make it easy to move. They're like handles. And they can come off when it's in storage, um, so they're not in the way. Number three objects, um, very heavy objects, self-supporting, requiring two people to manipulate over 30 kilograms or 70 pounds. These are also ideal candidates for pallets or wheeled dollies or carts. Um, also, heavy industrial shelving is a great investment for stuff like this if you have a large collection. These are fossils um, that are stored in plaster clamshells. So these are custom-made contoured plaster mounts that are embedded with fiberglass to give them some support and strength. Um, so the fossils are held within this, and you can flip them um, upside down so you can look at the fossil from both sides easily, and they're bolted together. These are stored on plastic, commercially available plastic pallets on the heavy industrial shelving. Um, you could even just store these directly on the shelving as well. Um, sometimes you can place heavy objects on smooth boards uh, that you can be, which can be more easily pulled off of shelves. And you can build the small wheel dollies or carts for these types of objects if you're going to store them on the floor. Number four objects, um, you can store these attached to fixed racks with ties or hooks. And you can also modify shelving units um, to hold long objects upright between like padded dividers. Um, or in this case, for this fragile New Guinea mask, we made custom boxes uh, for these large objects. The box is made from a thick corrugated polypropylene plastic. Um, and we fastened the corners with nuts and bolts and washers. And then the lids are just made of, of uh, regular weight corrugated plastic, and the corners are sewn. Um, we also label the outsides of these boxes really well, and then put photographs of the object on the outside, and that really increase, improves access. Number four objects are also um, really great to coordinate a storage plan with um, commercially available shelf uprights. So we've got a bunch of different systems where we use shelf uprights. Um, if you look on this whole system, um, we took shelf supports and we just cut the fronts of them off. So they're only 8 inches wide. Um, this is in a place in storage where there's 8 inches between uh, compacted cabinets and the wall. So we built, uh, we have our shelf supports that attach to the shelf uprights. They're 8 inches wide. We put uh, corrugated or plastic shelf on top of them with a little backer rod in the open channel. And that uh, protects the objects from the opening of the cabinet doors. So the nothing sticks out more than 8 inches. So when the doors open, they bump into the shelf and not into the objects. And then we made um, either custom padded boards. This is a corrugated plastic board with little tabs that hook into the shelf uprights. Um, and then we tie that with cotton tying tape. And then we also made um, a custom jig just out of nails on a board and 
um, bent wire around it to make these hooks. And the hooks kind of snap into the shelf uprights, and then we padded them with a uh, backer rod. And then at the bottom, we make little backer rod um, supports to capture the bottoms of these long objects so they don't fall forward. You can accomplish the same thing a little more simply if you don't have as many objects. Uh, and this is from the Reorg Tumblr. And these are um, just nails. They're regular commercially available nails with polyethylene foam wrapped around them. And they're supporting these tools on the wall. Number five objects are heavy objects, self-supporting, can be carried by one person using equipment, uh, 10 to 30 kilograms or 20 to 70 pounds. So this is another place where pallets are a great um, option. You can also put things directly on shelves and shelving units um, or have trays that can slide out. This pallet, for example, um, for this large iron kettle, is um, it's made with feet so you can get your hands underneath it or that you can get uh, the equipment underneath it. We designed this specifically for one of our um, foot-operated hydraulic lifts. Um, so you can put the lift up to it and you can pull it off by yourself. Or two people can just lift it off the shelf um, without any equipment. And we chose plywood for this piece because it's really sturdy, it's inexpensive, um, and the piece is stored on an open shelf in an area with a lot of ventilation so we don't have to worry about acid buildup from the wood. And then we have a barrier between the object and the piece so that um, we don't have acid migration to the metal object. You could also make um, trays or small sliding pallets from archival materials like corrugated plastic or acid-free cardboard. You just want to make sure that what you're building is strong enough to support the object so you don't want it to bend or anything when you pick the object up with it. You could consider using um, plastic boards like those made from expanded PVC that's the name brand is Sintra as an option as well, but you don't want to use those with sensitive materials. You want to make sure you're using those in a well-ventilated area. Number six objects are the most um, have the most solutions on stash. So if you've got number six objects, which it looks like many of you do, um, you'll find tons of solutions. Um, stable objects stored in fixed furniture may not even need a mount. You can just put them on a shelf or put them in a drawer. Um, but unstable objects or objects stored on compactors are going to need more support. Cradles rings, cavities are really good solutions for these kinds of objects. Um, there are two options for storing figurines. You can store them on a cradle on a board or um, in the bottom with this little kachina. Uh, this is a two-part sliding mount. So the object sits on one side of the mount, and then it slides into the other side of the mount and secures the object standing. More options for uh, number six objects. Um, things like these stone tools, they don't really need any mounts. Um, this is on a custom uh, shelving unit we just made from commercially available supplies to fit this little awkward space between a building column and a cabinet. Um, but when we built the shelf, we didn't know how heavy we were going to fill it. So we can't add more shelves to this without compromising the integrity of the shelf. Um, if we'd known how many stone tools our archaeologists wanted to put on it, we would have uh, built it a little sturdier in the first place. So um, he's a little frustrated with that, but we'll find other places for his tools. Uh, the other things that you can do uh, with number six objects is you can isolate them with your storage um, in terms of hazardous materials like the taxidermy eagle on the bottom right that's um, arsenic positive mount. Or the other one on the top right is uh, Etruscan bronze uh, pitcher that we have stored in a dry container. So there's silica gel in there. But by containing these number six objects into um, isolated microclimate storage, they can then be stored with other objects that aren't affected. Number seven objects, objects that can be held in one hand. You'll also find tons of solutions for on, on Stash and on the Reorg Tumblr. Um, you can use commercially available archival trays. You can modify those trays. You can make your own trays. They're a great way to store things. Uh, you can even store small, robust objects in Ziploc bags. Um, and just to sort of protect them, you can add a piece of heavy paper or mat board in the bag for support, as you can see in the lower right. Um, this is a great way to reuse scrap as well, so that you're using all the little bits of your archival material. You can also adapt hanging files um, in 
file cabinets to store either slide or photo sleeves filled with small flat objects like coins. Number eight objects, uh, those are 3D textiles. That would be things like costumes, um, clothing, um, skins, and uh, puppets. These can be hung from padded hangers or rods. Um, so you can adapt a commercially available hanger, as you can see in the top images, um, by padding them with polyester batting and then covering that batting with cotton stockinette or cotton muslin. And that will support many kinds of garments. And you can also adapt those hangers with extra foam or things like that to support um, irregular garments. Number eight objects can also be hung from uh, padded rods, as you can see with these um, church vestments or that are in the top uh, right picture. And then some um, fragile number eight objects, like these bandolier bags that are in the bottom right corner, um, should be stored flat with um, padding in the folds. And the one in front, the red with the red field on it, uh, that's a really fragile piece that is also accessed very frequently. So we made a rigid tray um, that it sits on so it can be removed from the drawer without any, any disturbance to the piece. Uh, you can also make. Um, covers for your hanging things. You can make individual covers out of cotton or Tyvek and, and attaching a photograph of, uh, of the garment or the textile or the puppet to the outside helps um, identify the piece, helps with the excess. And then uh, you can also cover whole units with Tyvek or muslin or polyester. Our number nine objects are objects that should be stored flat. So these would be fragile textiles, unframed artwork, photographs, metal plates, works on paper, things like that. Um, the top left image is a modified system we put into some existing cantilever shelving. So we built um, shelves from, uh, this is, styrofoam insulation um, that we bored holes in and then put a uh, metal uh, electrical conduit pipes through it. And then the shelves, or the shelves themselves, are just rigid pieces of uh, polycarbonate plastic. And then the woven mats are the objects they fit within it. This is a way to maximize storage space um, in existing shelving that you can adjust. You can also adjust shelving and commercially available shelving units, like these wire units. You can just add more shelves. Um, you might also want to consider looking for flat files. They're really handy, and sometimes you can get them used through resellers or like university surplus, that kind of stuff. And then small flat objects can be stored in paper folders, and then those paper folders can be grouped by you know, upright boxes or things in, um, in file cabinets just to uh, protect them and keep them contained. Number 10 are objects that can be rolled. So these would be textiles, carpets, plant, you know, big pieces of paper, tapestries, um, things like that. We adapt acidic paper tubes. Um, ar archival acid-free tubes can be quite expensive. And also, um, they're buffered, generally. And that buffer can wear out sometimes, and they then become acidic. So what we do is we just take existing cardboard tubes we get from our lighting designer, <laughs> and we cover them with marble seal, which is an aluminum foil that, that traps the acids on the inside of the tube, and they don't migrate out. And then we pad them with, um, with cotton or the polyester batting and then cover them with cotton stuck in it. And when you roll your object, you put a piece of tissue down under the object and you roll that first to pick up the object with the rolled tube. And then as you keep rolling it, you can put another piece of tissue towards the end. So when you wrap it entirely in tissue. Um, when you're rolling large textiles, you want to make sure to have lots of people on hand and lots of space so that you can get a nice even roll for your, for your object. And then you can tie the um, you can cover the roll with more paper, or you can cover the roll with a mylar, mylar melanex polyester film, and then tie that shut with um, cotton tying tape. You can put a little bit of a piece of blotter paper underneath the tying tape if you want to protect the uh, object from the knot in the, um, in the tying tape. And then there's a lot of different ways to store uh, rolled objects. Uh, the bottom right image is a drawer that's custom um, made to store rolled textiles. 
But there are so many options for storing rural text tools that you'll find on Stash and you'll find on the Reart Tumblr. Um, one way is to once again use those shelf uprights. Um, we made custom S hooks to store the, um, you know, conduit pipes, and then the rural text tools go on that. Uh, this other one on the top right is uh, like a little hanging hook with a chain that goes up to that. Or the bottom right, those are um, bolts that go through the bottom of the uh, shelf support, and then we drilled holes in the conduit pipes to, to hold um, the rolled piece. Those are actually photo papers for a photo station, but you could adapt that for storage, object storage as well. So you can make, uh, if you have a large collection of rolled objects, um, you can invest in a custom sliding storage, which as you can see on the left, or you can build your own out of chains that hang from a ceiling. Um, and then if you only have a, a handful of rolled things, you can hang them from uh, hooks onto existing uh, wall racks or fixed racks, as you can see in the, the um, image on the far right. Um, it's kind of a an elegant solution with the extra padding of, at the foam behind the um, tube just to give it a little support. And you can also adapt that kind of padding between the, the rack and the tube um, for storage within a shelf or um, within a cabinet. If you're just storing like one rolled textile in a cabinet, you can make um, cardboard or, excuse me, foam cradles to support the ends of the roll to lift it just slightly off of the the deck or off of the drawer so that the, the object itself is in, in contact with the space. Number 11 objects. Um, if you have a small collection of these small 2D objects under 50 centimeters or one and a half feet, you can really maximize your um, storage space by building customized uh, compartments or bins. They can be built out of plywood, especially if you're in a well-ventilated area. Um, and you want to line like the bottoms of the bins with um, with foam or acid-free board to prevent acid migration from the plywood to the objects, and also to ease in access to be able to slide the pieces in and out. Uh, small 2D objects can also be stored on existing shelving. You can run cables or or um, you know cables or rods to um, create that separation to put the objects in. Or um, you can look into fixed racks or wall racks. Um, you can get expensive ones. You can get inexpensive ones. Um, and you can hang your objects from them with um, S hooks. These can be really useful if you have a large collection of um, 2D art. And our last category is number 12, large 2D objects over 50 centimeters or one and a half feet. Um, so obviously, the um, hanging racks that are sliding are sort of the industry standard, but they can be really expensive. So you could, once again, use those wall racks or fixed racks. Um, or this is a solution on the right that we came up with at my institution. Um, these types of objects are outliers in our collection. So these are uh, casts of fossils. And we took our shelf upright system, and then we made a little channel out of PVC pipe cut in half that um, has a tiny notch at each shelf uh, support so that it sits in there. And then we put a little bit of a screw just to secure it. And then we uh, pad that channel with, with polyethylene foam and put the objects in. They kind of lean back against the wall. We can pad behind them. And then we use cotton tying tape across the front of it just loosely so they don't fall forward. And this isn't an ideal situation um, for most places, but for us it works really well, um, which is kind of the, the gist of, of a creative storage solution. Um, PVC pipe, even though it's made of PVC, which is generally a no-no in collections, it's a relatively solid piece. It, it, the PVC that makes up pipes uh, is longer lasting, is not as reactive. And these are fossil casts, and this is in a well-ventilated area, so we're not trapping a sensitive object right next to uh, a less than perfect material. So in building collections, you want to put together like your own toolbox of your favorite tools. But these are some really handy tools to have. Um, one is an impulse sealer. Um, 
or heat sealer at the upper left, and so that is great for making bags or for you know gluing together or heat sealing together um, polyethylene um, sheeting or marble seal, that kind of stuff. Uh, glue gun is essential. You can use that with standard glue sticks. Um, this is a nice selection on the lower left of uh, utility knives, scissors, cotton tying tapes, micro spatulas, bone folders. These are all really useful for box making and, and mount making. And then on the lower right, we've got an awl, a crochet hook, and a yarn needle. And those are also really helpful for um, tying corners together, adding handles, you know, like looped cotton tape handles to things, um, tying objects down to, to mounts, which we do sometimes as well. Some more of my favorite tools are these foam carving knives uh, that are seen on the left. Um, they're available from Benchmark and from University Products. There's also the big uh, one that looks kind of like a saw is actually a foam knife. Um, it's really great for cutting plank foam. And the uh, cork borer set and the rotary cutter are also really handy. And then on the right, there is calipers, a safety ruler, a a profile gauge, which is nice for irregularly shaped objects, a triangle just to make sure you're keeping things square, and just a simple measuring tape. I noted today on the yeah. collections list that there was a long discussion of the best knives to cut plank out the foam. So if you're on that list, check it out. There are some great solutions and great suggestions of knives that everyone likes. Um, you know, just be happy. Find the tools you like. You can look for them at hardware stores, art supply stores, fabric, craft, or hobby stores. Um, knives you can get at restaurant supply stores. Often, like the knives that are used for commercial kitchens are really great sources, um, or really great tools for working with collections uh, storage. So just to sum up some of my tips, it's great to prototype your mount so that you kind of know what you want to make and figure out how you can standardize it. Um, Write your instructions down, especially if you're going to train a team to make these mounts. And the nice thing about having them written down is that if your idea is great and you want to submit it to Stash, you're already halfway through the process because you've written down how you're going to do your how you're going to do your mounts. And don't be afraid to tweak your methods for efficiency as you start working on them. Um, when we worked on our collections move, we were able to to modify how we were making mounts, just looking at how our really creative volunteers were were solving some problems on the on the fly, which was great. Um, and then when working with the team, you want to really assess talent. Not everybody's good at everything, so you know don't 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 assign things to people that they're not good at. You know, if someone's really good at cutting square boards, have them cut square boards. And if someone's really good at making foam rings, then have them make foam rings. They don't have to make the whole mount themselves. And obviously, don't forget about first aid. Mount making is kind of dangerous. We use hot glue. We use sharp knives. Uh, make sure that you're set up for that. And make sure that you're um, training people to not get hurt. And then monitor your pace. Be really deliberate when you're working with objects. Um, it's, it's, you know, seems an obvious thing, but you know, you can get busy and you can start working really fast, especially on a large project. You want to avoid um, this situation, as shown on the lower right, which is an object that was actually glued into its mount um, because it was placed back in the mount before the hot glue had hardened. So that that's a conservation treatment in the future, basically, when that object needs to be removed from the mount. So um, we're going to move into our materials section. Um, materials can be really tricky. So ideally, they're inert. They don't break down. Um, and they're non-reactive, meaning they're not going to react with your objects. But in reality, archival materials are expensive. We are a small market, so nobody's building things specifically for us at you know, a volume discount. Um, so it can be expensive to, to source the best materials. Um, so it's better to, or if you can, look at evaluating the risk of uh, chemical and contamination from materials um, to your objects. So you want to start from your objects. So objects made from chemically sensitive materials are at a higher risk of damage from contaminants in storage than uh, objects that aren't made from chemically sensitive materials. So what do I mean by a sensitive object? Um, things like metal. Um, mixed objects, composite objects that are made of more than one material, uh, plastics, because they break down themselves, so they're going to react in a poor storage environment, um, some types of leather and paper and books. Uh, the object at the upper right is an archaeological shell, so that's also uh, an object that can absorb pollutants in its environment. And then also uh, film and media collections. 
And then um, objects that are more stable would be things that are generally inorganic, but some organics as well are more stable and then less reactive chemically, things like stone, um, ceramics, we go back to our number six bowl, uh, things made from wood that's well cured, um, and some natural history collections like insects and um, study skins um, and taxidermy. So um, I'm going to pass it back over to Rachel. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I'm just going to chip in with a, a, a couple of um, additional tools that, that I love. Um, one thing that I found um, when I was working with one uh, collection was uh, a series of cookie cutters that wound up being great for um, sort of boring out shapes in, in foam, sort of you know little round um, shapes for, for wells. Um, and I also like having a, a hair dryer or a hot air gun uh, sometimes for, for molding things. Um, and uh, that was a good catch on the, the collections list discussion. I think that's the kind of thing that um, if people have those kinds of tips, we can also use the stash uh, blog it's uh, listed on the website as the Stash News Session, and there are some um, great things there about uh, workspaces, like one uh, um, place that I'd worked, the, their um, art handler was, uh, had, had all these columns in his space that were, um, could be seen as a real downside for um, you know, sort of always being in the way, but he managed to um, put up all these sort of Velcro uh, um, panels and, and other things so he could hang tools off of them and, and have them be really handy. Um, so as you're working, making sure that you also have a setup, um, you know, a workstation that's uh, safe and efficient is, uh, is really important, especially if you're doing large projects where people are going to be spending a long time making mounts. You want to make sure that they're working in a sort of ergonomic uh, and healthy way. So one of the questions that um, that I get, and I assume other conservators do too, is you know why why all the white stuff? Like why do we always go for the things that are boring? Um, some of these uh, these things um, these materials come in um, various colors and and options. And why is it that we're you know we we are always going for? for the, the bland. Um, and I think there's a, a couple of, of reasons for that. One is um, in we tend to want to use materials that are in sort of their least, uh, um, their, their sort of most natural form. So, uh, so for instance, we would prefer in some cases to have unbleached muslin, sort of natural muslin, rather than, than bleached muslin cotton. Uh, the additional step of bleaching you know, adds other um, materials uh, to that textile. Um, and you know, it, when using textiles in general, sometimes when we buy them, there's extra things like size in them that you, know, you might want to, to wash out. Um, when we look at foams, um, the foam generally comes out in some sort of you know, translucent or you know, white color very often in order to make it the funky blue or you know deep black um, they're adding other pigments or um, dyes to those things and um, understanding how that uh, acts with the material over time or what might happen uh, in an emergency situation uh, like a flood and making sure that things are, are color stable um, adds like another complexity. Um, one of the other reasons that uh, we recommend using things that are white or light colored is that in storage it helps you monitor um, for things like potential pest infestations uh, and um, or you know dirt, the pollutant buildup. Um, so you know you, it's really easier to see um, if there's you know frass or insect casings um, or you know or visible dust if. Um, your material is light. Um, so what you're seeing um, here are a few examples of um, uh, of sample boards or what um, or touch boards. So um, it is it is complicated sometimes where somebody will say, um, oh, you know, I'm using ethafoam or I, I'm using Tyvek or or Rime, and it's like then you go online and you realize, oh, there's lots of different choices here, and how do I 
how do I decide? Um, so many suppliers that um, work with our uh, um, industry, Rebecca mentioned a few names, um, and there's more on, on some of these other um, resources. They, they will have um, sample books, or um, sometimes their catalog will explain it um, a little bit more in depth, you know, what is used for what. But, uh, and other times, you know, you can request um, small samples of things and developing, um, you know, some sort of um, package that allows you to uh, train volunteers or other staff and sort of identify what the materials are is great. Uh, keeping your materials um, labeled uh, in storage so that you know what you're, you're getting. Uh, dating them so that you know um, when they came in, in case, you know, every once in a while we hear about something happening with a funky batch of, of foam or something like that that allows you to go back to, to the supplier and, you know, talk about when you ordered it and make sure that um, there isn't anything else you need to know. Um, the other thing you're seeing um, down here is um, what's called a, a pH pen. Uh, which allows you to sometimes, um, uh, it, it should not be used on objects, and, um, but if you have a lot of tissue and you're trying to figure out, is this you know, buffered, is it unbuffered, is it just sort of um, newsprint that somebody had lying around, um, a, a little swipe on a, a corner allows you to sort of figure out um, what kind of material you have here. So we, we tend to, to recommend a sort of limited palette of materials for, uh, for, for housings that are in contact with your object uh, because those are materials that are known to sort of age well, as Rebecca said, and um, not, not be so reactive. Sometimes there, you know, there are substitutes. But, um, but as you saw also from what Rebecca described, there are ways to use materials that we don't normally recommend with, um, with certain, certain kinds of less reactive uh, artifacts. So let's start talking about foam. Foam very often is in direct contact with our, our pieces. So this might be a place where um, I'd recommend sticking with uh, some of the, the, the preservation suppliers or, or known manufacturers. You'll see um, polyethylene foam uh, mentioned in catalogs by a number of brand names. So you'll see Ethafoam, Volara, Cellucushion, Minicell, um, and, and there's a variety of uh, densities and thicknesses. So you'll see it in um, plank. Uh, in you know one or two inch, uh, you'll see it on on rolls. Uh, sometimes it'll have you know waves in it. Sometimes it'll be flat. Sometimes you can get it as a uh, sheet. Um, some of the thinner versions, such as the Volara or the Cellu Cushion um, rolls, can be used to line shelves and trays. And then thicker versions, such as the the planks, can be used to carve to create you know those wedges or cavity mounts for, for fragile objects. Uh, sometimes you'll see foams also listed as open cell or closed cell. Um, and so um, that has to do with the, the manufacturing and you know, um, the smoothness sometimes. So you'll see something like Volara will have like a, a sort of um, skin on it that makes it a little bit softer. Uh, whereas like the, the plank um, ethafoam um, uh, on the cut edges, very often it's a little bit rougher and you might want to um, cover that. So um, let's see. One of the things also, I spent a, a few years working overseas. I know that, um, that we have uh, uh, one participant here um, from from Israel, where I was working. For me, uh, working overseas was a was a challenge, just because um, I was working in another language and I didn't have access to all the preservation suppliers that I relied on when I was here. And um, you know, very often, even when I would call the distributors, they didn't necessarily have some of the information I was looking for. So I, you know, I definitely appreciate uh, the one, what we, what we have here in terms of access and information. And two, I would say for those of you, since we have a number of participants overseas, 
Um, we do try and on some of these resources to list sort of what is the core um, material in these phones or, uh, or items, and you know you can do the best. And we'll talk um, in a few minutes about some other um, resources for you. But one of the things that you can do is again focus in on what's going to be in contact with your with your object, and um, so that that you can um, use your your resources wise, wisely. Um, if you you know, are keeping a close eye on your collection. Um, uh oh, um, I seem to have lost my screen. Mike, Susan. Okay. Mike seems to be working on it. There we go. Okay, terrific. We're back. Okay, so um, this uh, backer rod is another um, you know form for the the um, foam rod. You saw a couple of uh, nice examples that um, in Rebecca's slides about ways that you can use this either as rings. There are a few um, tips on the stash site for, for how to do that. Um, it can also be used to, to pad out the edges of things. Um, and this is you know, also a material that um, is often available at local home stores. Uh, we recommend um, Ordering it online, though, maybe rather than just picking it up at your local store so you can be sure that you're getting polyethylene rod and not something like polyurethane um, or Denver foam, which is produced by the same manufacturer. Uh, and you know, sometimes it can be really difficult to, um, to know the, the difference just by, by touch or feel. So you know, you'll see lots of other foams sometimes. There are things like polyurethane foams. That would be one that you'd want to stay away from. Uh, some of the black um, and other sort of white, uh, sort of uh, softer foams are things that you may see used in temporary applications, like a storage crate, but maybe would not be our, you know, the first choice for a long-term um, application. So another material that um, that I like a lot is uh, is Teflon tape. It's sometimes um, being sold now as uh, by preservation vendors as artifact wrap. Uh, this is the same material that um, that's used by plumbers in thin widths, um, and that you can buy it sort of uh, the in the the blue. Uh, roll that you see there, the small one, um, is the kind of thing that you can buy in your local hardware store. So this um, smooth and versatile wrap can be used to secure specimens to mount. So it could be used in place of something like the cotton twill ties, um, and you know, securing loose el elements. It sticks to itself and not the the object. Uh, so sometimes you don't even need to tie it if you've wrapped it around a couple of of times. Um, Again, you know, when possible, we uh, would choose the white rather than um, sometimes it comes in, in other colors. The two rolls that you see on the, the right are the same material um, in a floss form. Um, and uh, so sometimes that's uh, the same as, as what you're getting um, in dental floss. Uh, and so you can check there. Sometimes it's nylon, and sometimes it'll say that it's a, a Teflon um, floss in which case then it's also safe to use in, in a similar manner. Um, Mike, um, we, we did cover slides 51 through 54, so we're, we're all set. Um, the next is a material that we uh, like a lot for use in storage, it's marble seal. So this is a material that's um, fairly expensive. But um, but the good thing about it is that it can be used to compensate for um, other lower grade uh, materials like uh, MDF or particle board that uh, that might off gas if they were in direct contact. Marble seal is a barrier film composed of laminated nylon, aluminum, and polyethylene. It's often used for bags and linings, 
Um, if you, you know, have bought food in some of these like little metal foil pouches, um, that's the kind of thing that Marvel Seal is. It's a really effective bar vapor barrier for the transmission of water vapor um, and also for atmospheric pollutants. The, um, the kinds that, uh, that we tend to use are the ones with the, the nylon or polyethylene inner layer. So that allows it to bond to itself. Um, and a heat sealer can be used to form an airtight seal. Um, you can, if you don't have a heat sealer, you can also use like a smaller tacking iron um, or even just a regular household iron. We often use it to create bags um, for passive humidity control and storage. Uh, it can be used, like Rebecca has mentioned, to line shelves. Uh, what you're seeing here on the right is a picture from uh, conservator Ellen Carley's blog, where she's um, used it to line a storage crate um, with an object uh, that is at risk of off-gassing from all of the exposed wooden surfaces. Um, uh, you often might um, hear about it being used to create um, uh, packages that are used for low oxygen environments with anoxic uh, treatment for pest infestations. Um, Marvel Seal does come in um, different grades. Marvel Seal 470 is more easily heat sealed, while Marvel Seal 360 is more puncture resistant. Um, and Marvel Seal 1311 um, is a vapor barrier with a polyethylene foil, polyethylene laminate, um, and a polycotton scrim facing, which allows you to easily attach it to wooden crates or shelving using a wood glue or other adhesive. So, um, so there's a bunch of different um, products that, that you can um, choose from for your application. Again, a role of this is pricey, but um, if you um, can't get, get access or it's you know, just out of your um, budget range for, for now, you could try doing the same thing with aluminum, with a heavy duty aluminum foil. Um, you wouldn't be able to heat seal it, but um, you might be able to, to wrap it around you know, a tube and, and um, that might be good enough for, um, for your first, uh, first stage. You know, again, the thing that um, we want to emphasize here is that um, reorg is really looking at um, making improvements to the big picture. Once you've increased access to um, your collections and have a more organized storage space, um, that work will allow you then um, you know, to go back and then make additional upgrades as time and budget allows. Uh, and you'd probably be able to, to do so with even an increased ability to understand, you know, budget for, for materials. So it's, it's not, you know, um, necessary for you to, to worry that you haven't done enough or that um, everything needs to be done and be perfect. Uh, you know, the reorg is just getting you, um, you know, it's making progress. Um, so, and <clears throat> Tyvek sheet is uh, a material that you've probably all, you know, seen or used in, in one form. Uh, you, if you've driven by a home in construction, you may have seen it, um, you know, the big uh, Tyvek was, you know, it's printed on one side, it'll say Tyvek home wrap. Um, uh, the um, mailers that are that sort of uh, thick uh, material that's impossible to, um, to rip open uh, is uh, very often made out of Tyvek. It also comes in several grades, so you can get one that's uh, really thick and, um, and stiff. Uh, but then there's also something called like the, the soft wrap, um, which if you wash it, it becomes even softer. Uh, so in order to, to do that, what you're seeing on the top right is one of those uh, impact sailors that Rebecca mentioned. And so that um, is using that really soft uh, floppy Tyvek that's in there has been washed in a washing machine um, on a, on a, you know, with cool water, no detergent even, and then allowed to air dry. If you put it in your dryer, it will you know, melt. But, um, it, and then it's super soft, so you can use it to tuck into ethafoam, like you see here on the corners, to pad out some, some rougher uh, ethafoam. Or the stiffer stuff is used here on the left um, as liners and sort of slip sheets for these um, really crumbly 
um, plant fiber pieces. Uh, Tyvek is often um, really great to use with polyester batting um, to create inner supports and, um, and uh, cores. What you're seeing here are pieces of these two-part moccasin mounts. Uh, that were um, made at NMAI. So there was one piece that was made sort of for the toe pillow and another that would go in um, the heel so that they could be easily inserted. Um, so polyester batting is something that's really cheap and easily available um, all over the place. Um, for storage of collections, we want to avoid plastics with additives like plasticizers or fillers, again, often because of off-gassing. So, Safer plastic choices for containers include polyethylene, uh, low density, or LDPE, um, or um, polycylene, which is PET, um, polypropylene, sometimes um, listed as PP, and also acrylic. Acrylic is much more uh, brittle, um, so the acrylic boxes will not usually have the same kinds of snap-on and tops, uh, so you know that would just be um, something that uh, if, you're, if you're trying to come up with a, a container and a lid. So um, here, if you are um, looking for, for things that are like food grade plastics, uh, some of the uh, recycling guidelines um, would, would sometimes be a decent uh, guide for what that plastic is. So you'd want to focus in on um, plastics that have the little triangle with a number one a four or a five. So those um, should be a guide. Um, often you'll see other um, kinds of um, corrugated boards. Um, sometimes they're called blue board, which are the, the paper boards. Um, but then you'll also see polypropylene board, um, sometimes known by its trade name Coroplast. Um, uh, Frat, this is something I know is also is available uh, in Israel because it's uh, used all the time outside for the pergolas. Um, here in the U.S., you can often um, get them sometimes with these pre-made tab and slot uh, construction, so they come flat, uh, and it's a nice way of um, coming up with a, a quick ready-made um, uh, solution that is easy to store until, until you need it. A lot of the preservation vendors, or at least several of them, will make things um, if, you, if you're if you doing a large rehousing project. So they will work with you to, to come up with um, sizes or shapes if, um, if there's an order that would be large enough. Um, or they can recommend a product that they already have. Um, sometimes a large institution like the Smithsonian or um, NARA has placed an order, and then when there's leftover, they will have things that may or may not make it into the catalog. So it's always worth reaching out to the preservation um, vendors to, to ask. Um, so the Coroplast is great for, um, for things that are a little bit heavier or um, need a more robust support. But the acid-free board comes in various corrugations. Um, and the, the number of uh, corrugations and their orientation will depend on um, how strong or flexible they are. So you'll see things as listed as D flute or E flute and single wall and double wall. So um, the, the double wall will make things stronger, um, but a little bit harder to manipulate if you're turning it into boxes or, or trays. Um, the nice thing about the, the corrugated paperboard is that um, it, there's a lot of solutions on Stash that talk about how to make it into all si kinds of uh, containers. Um, so it, you know, it's something that you can um, choose to, to make into you know, something that's space efficient and, and customized if you need it. Um, a little bit about hot melt glue. We have um, you can you know, sort of get your Martha Stewart on and use uh, hot, your hot glue gun. Just make sure that you use the right glue for your material. Um, hot melt glue is, is uh, sold either as low temperature, which is appropriate for the paperboard um, and uh, foam, but you need to use the high temperature glues for um, coroplast, and that can sometimes go straight through your foams. 
so, um, you know, this is also, as uh, Rebecca said, you know, something where you just need to be uh, mindful uh, on one big project. Uh, probably the, the number of the greatest number of injuries was caused by by hot melt glue uh, drips. So, especially that that high temperature, you need to you need to be careful. Um, so, for practical alternatives. Um, Again, some of the things that you can consider are washed cotton fabric, um, and you know, in places where um, you may not have, uh, you know, a lot of um, tissue or the soft Tyvek um, uh, wood shelves, you can use for less sensitive places, and then you know, put a, a barrier level of, of something else between the shelves and the object. Uh, sometimes you can use the high-density polyethylene, um, things like painter's drop cloths or trash bags um, can be a helpful barrier uh, also to, to line or um, cover things. Um, as we said before, the food-grade plastics tend to be the, the plastic types that um, we would be looking for. And um, doing things like Rebecca mentioned um, with acidic cardboard tubes um, you can cover them with mylar or marble seal if you if you can't afford the the acid free um, tubes. So um, the things that we tend to avoid are are things like vinyl or PVC. Although you know, as we've seen I, when I was in Israel, I did also use PVC pipe sometimes uh, as bases for um, wobbly ceramics and would line them with backer rod. Um, things made out of rubber, which is inherently unstable, and wool, which is such a, an attractive. Um, uh, product for for pests, so wool and wool felts would be things that I would um, would stay away from. So two other resources to to know about um, the uh, AIC, in conjunction with a number of other organizations and institutions, has developed has started the Materials Working Group. Uh, this group is uh, has a, a sort of two year mission to come up with a plan to create an online resource that will um, present additional material for um, choosing safe materials for exhibit storage and transport. Uh, right now, if you go onto the um, AIC wiki, you'll be able to sort of see what the, the goals are for the, the various subgroups of this. And um, we're sort of one year in by the, the next, uh, by the end of the second year, we'll have a, uh, a sort of um, we'll give a little bit more information about what the, the working group has come up with in terms of uh, a plan. But there are starts of, of resources and, um, and things that, that you can access already. Uh, one of those is um, a, a longstanding resource, uh, Cameo, which is supported by the Museum of Fine Arts. And um, if you, this is also a wiki. If you go into the, the search bar, you can type a material like ethafoam or Volara, and um, it will tell you what is that material. Is it a trade name? What are some other trade names for it? Um, it'll tell you whether it's, you know, uh, sometimes if it's safe to use or how it's used. We're incorporating some material um, from the Packin uh, website and some of the entries, which is a little bit more focused on um, the practical uses of the material. And the Packin website is another. Um, great uh, resource for um, practical information used by art handlers and, and preparators. So um, the AC Wiki, Cameo, and Packin are all places where you can get additional website, um, the stash materials list. Um, so I think that is about what we um, we wanted to, to cover on this webinar. You know, this is just to give you an idea of the kinds of things to think about as you sort of so you can think about the solutions, which will then lead into next week's webinar about like if we know how we want to store stuff and and what we can and have available for storing things, it will help us plan um, in advance for our reorg day. So the assignment that we have for um, the next webinar for um, ongoing if you're if you're working on your Credly badge for this course is to come up with um, storage concepts for three outliers in your collections using the, the um, 12 object categories of reorg. So if you have you know, a large uh, oversized you know, um, 3D piece, if you have something, you know, a large you know, 2D piece or you know, something even super teeny tiny, 
three things that wouldn't be part of necessarily what um, you'd be doing in sort of bulk. Uh, and so, um, you know, think about, uh, like, look at the Tumblr page, look at Stash, uh, you know, if you've had a, a concept. So come try and come up with, with three ideas that you think you might be able to implement. Um, and the next is to start a list of um, the, the storage materials that you have on hand or that you think might be applicable to the kinds of um, rehousing and storage that you would want to do. So that is the next assignment. And um, I think, Susan, we have, we have a, a few minutes left for, for, for questions. Yeah, we have a few questions. and. Um, I'll send them to you if we don't get through them so you can write answers and I'll post them. Um, so uh, Angela Sigala asked, uh, what kind of foot-operated forklift were you using, or um, foot-operated lift? The one that we're using is about 50 years old, um, and we've maintained it well. But I did a quick web search, and you can get them from like materials handling um, places like Granger or Uline, you want to look for a foot-operated hydraulic platform lift truck. Um, so basically, it's got little forks on it. You can deck it, and then you just pump it up and down. The one that we have is really smooth, which is nice. And it's small. Okay. You can get into spaces. Maybe you can write that down for me, and I'll post it. You bet. Um, so let's see. Amber Tarnowski says, I need sources for coring tubes. Um, like that shown in the left of a picture? You can get those um, from scientific supply houses, like Carolina Biological Supply. And I, in a quick search, I saw you could also get them um, through Amazon. They're called cork borers. So I'll search for that. Okay. Right. The other um, thing that, that you can use for that kind of thing is, um, aside from something like the, you know, the cookie cutters or whatever, is that um, if you have metal pipe and someone with access, um, you can sort of sharpen the edges of that to, you know, to have borers um, you know, or cores in various sizes. Right. OK. Um, Amber also asks, is mini cell an archival quality foam? I'm not familiar um, with mini cell. So uh, in. Um, past projects, I, we have used Minicell in um, in contact with with objects. It's been a number of years, so I you know we'd have to go back and sort of check if Minicell, as currently being manufactured, you know, a decade later, is the same as what we were using um, back then. But at that time, it was a con it, you know it was tested and um, was on our approved list of, of materials. OK. Um, since we're almost out of time, uh, Maria Garcia Morales has a question that's pertinent to the homework. And that is, I did not quite understand the concept of outliers regarding to the collection. Um, so outliers are, are, are three things that might be, uh, or in this case, we're, we're just saying three. Um, but outliers would be the things that um, probably wouldn't be served by the bulk solutions that you'd hopefully be coming up with. Um, so let's say it may be, let's say you have a lot of textiles and most of them can be rolled, but one of them is a whole, you know, sort of costume um, that needs to be stored together. So like that would be, an, you know, an outlier. Or maybe, you know, most of your things are small, three-dimensional pieces, but then you have like one really large oversized, you know, piece. So that one would be an outlier for what you would mostly be doing with your with your three-dimensional collections. So, um, you know, in next week's webinar, we'll be talking more about how you build an approach for the bulk of what you're doing. Um, and most of those are going to be things that are, are sort of fast or easily accomplished or, or you know, just getting it to the next stage so you can um, get your storage better. And then you may be going back, you know, to, for like a stage two as time, you know, time allows. But the outliers are things that you might need to deal with just to create space, um, you know, and get out of the way. Okay. Um, I think we're going to leave it there. I'll send you the rest of these questions 
Um, I also had two questions, and I'll send them to you, too. Um, okay. Sorry, it was a lot to cover, but there are, I can see that there are a lot of good questions going yeah, through, so we'll question. do our best to answer them. Yeah, and we'll see you all next week, and then after that, we have a month off, and we'll see you uh, the beginning of June. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Rebecca and Rachel, and um, I think that went really well. Thanks. Yeah. Thank all of you for listening. Yeah. Okay, speak to you next week.